Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to be introducing our opening speaker for today, Admiral Michelle Howard. So Admiral Howard graduated from the US Naval Academy in 1982 and graduated with a master's in the military arts and sciences at the Army's Command and General Staff College. She has served in numerous operations across the globe, including, but not limited to, Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, tsunami relief efforts in Indonesia, and a peacekeeping effort in the former Republic of Yugoslavia. Fittingly, she has received numerous awards, including the Captain Winifred Quick Collins Award for Inspirational Leadership, which is given to one woman officer a year. Throughout her career, Admiral Howard has achieved many historical firsts. She was the first African-American woman to command a ship in the U.S. Navy and to achieve three-star rank, and in 2014, four-star rank. Currently, she is the 38th Vice Chief of Naval Operations, being the first woman in African-American to do so. Simply put, she is just a remarkable and inspiring person. So everyone, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Admiral Michelle Howard. Thank you. Well, good morning. And thank you for uh, asking me to come speak to you today. So uh, strategic school marms. Some of you are like, where did that come from? So. I am not a stranger to the military because I grew up as the daughter of an Air Force Master Sergeant. And we lived all over the country. And he ended up retiring to Colorado, and I think it was our third or fourth time that we had lived there. And part of being a, in the school system in Colorado is they teach you about the West and your state history. And at that point, I became very fascinated with the West. But one of the things that caught my imagination was women as pioneers. And that one of the great things about the Wild West was that it became an environment for meritocracy. And that women were allowed to do things in the West that they weren't allowed to do several thousand miles in the East Coast. And so you could be a stagecoach driver. Uh, and you, you could grow up to be a world famous sharpshooter like Annie Oakley uh, and make a living at it that clearly if you, she'd grown up in the city of New York would not, have been, would not have been proper. But the other big thing is when you look at the education of who we are in the West, it was these one room schoolhouses and it was the women. And it was literally just about everything about life as well as the fundamentals from everything from biology to math, reading, writing, and arithmetic as they used to call it. And so these school marms literally helped educate and civilize the West, probably more than any other group. And so now as I move forward at this point in my life, I realize there are and have been pioneers who I think of as strategic school marms. These women have lessons for us if we just look closely at how they've lived and what they've done. And there's things we can learn from them, even if they're not still with us today. And so I wanted to talk to you about that, but I also wanted to talk to you about more broadly, thematically, what I've learned by looking at these school marms. And then I realized that if you're a pioneer, it's a journey. It is a journey, and I've had a few pioneering experiences myself. And I believe technically I can say that because I actually once got a trailblazing award from <laughs> DOD. And so I realized as I looked at these women, um, that there was sort of attributes that they had that were pretty common. And so I'm going to talk about those attributes. First of all, if you're going to be a pioneer, uh, you need to commit to the journey. You need to travel light. You need to have stamina. You need to have a sense of humor and a sense of help. And you need to stay connected to the other pioneers. So I will go through all of those. But then in particular for this group, I also want you to think about the strategic side of those attributes. That if you are a pioneer in creating a new strategy, you're going to need those same exact attributes to get to the execution of that strategy. So whether it's millennial development goals, it's one thing to put the plan together, it's another thing to get in the wagon and start driving across country, right? So let's start. Jeanette Rankin was born in the 1880s um, in Montana. And she literally worked on the ranch. And 
uh, big family, like most ranching families, and she was just very skilled. So her dad put her to work fixing machinery and being the carpenter. And so in addition to raising her younger brothers and sisters, he'd have her do something like build the sidewalk in front of an old ranch house so that they could rent it out um, and earn extra income. And so she ends up growing up, leaving the farm, getting her degree around the ranch around 1900, um, bachelor's in biology, was literally a teacher, a school mom for a while, and then gets excited about women's rights. And as one of the few human beings who figures out that even if women don't have the right to vote, that doesn't stop you from getting elected. And so Jeanette Rankin is the first woman to serve in Congress before women had the right to vote. Uh, she, she was a suffragette from the very beginning, and it was her passion for this pursuit of women for equal rights that made her say, I need to, I need to do this. Uh, and so she was in Congress as a congresswoman and was the only woman who was able to vote for women to get the right to vote. <laughs> her other fame is that uh, she voted against going to war in World War I. Uh, she fell out of political favor, and then she was reelected to office when she was much older in 1940. And then she, again, after Japanese attacked America, voted not to go to war, the only congressperson to do that. But Jeanette, it wasn't literally because she was necessarily a pacifist. She just had this broader principle. And what she said is, if I, as a woman, cannot be sent to war, I don't have the right to send any other human being to war. Um, unfortunately, passionate a pioneer as she was, that did not sit well. So she's the sole congressperson who did not vote to go to war with Japan. She was literally mobbed as she left the hill and <coughs> took refuge in a telephone booth and had to be rescued by the Capitol Police. And then that ended her political career. But she. This is a woman who we can learn a lot from in terms of strategic thinking and pursuit of rights. The second, Mildred McAfee, seventh president of Wellesley, actually the youngest president at her time of any of the schools. She was 36 when she became president of Wellesley in the 1920s, and um, multiple degrees and uh, I think she was the first woman to actually sit on the New Hampshire College's trustee board. Just a, a real go-getter. So World War II starts in this country. And all of the services realize we will need women to come into the services and pick up all of the occupations so that we can push men into the war fight. So Congress passes a law that women can be reservists. And the US Navy reaches out to Mildred McAfee and says, would you come in and be our first woman leader to stand up our women's organization, Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service or Waves? And she accepts. So she's commissioned as a lieutenant commander, and she brings in a few women to be her staff, and the Navy says, go do it. And she has to figure everything out from how do I recruit women to the uniforms, to the schoolhouses, to what jobs they're going to do in the Navy. And at one point, she went to the chief of naval operations and said, you know, I'm, here's what I'm thinking, what do I want to do? And he goes, Mildred, we hired you for your brains. Use your best judgment. <laughs> she did. She did. And so within a few years, there were 82,000 women serving in the Navy as waves which when you think about putting the infrastructure together to train that many women and to get them into jobs from yeomen, they were gunnery uh, instructors, uh, to intelligence specialists, it's, it's just phenomenal. And then at that point, when you talk about equal opportunity, Mildred, Lieutenant Commander Mildred McAfee, petitioned Congress because women came in as reservists, but they did not come in with equal pay to the men. And she said, that's wrong. They're doing the same job. And Congress goes, well, you know what? You're right. And they passed a law. And so they not only passed a law that um, women who were serving got the same pay as their male counterparts, they passed a law that there would be at least one woman captain in charge of each of the women's auxiliary corps. And so Mildred was promoted from lieutenant commander to captain. Yeah, so she only had two ranks in the Navy. Uh, 
and then served until the end of the war. And during that time frame, she was still president of Wellesley. She would come up here, no kidding, she would come up here 10 days a month to do her president job during the war. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to the stamina part in a minute, I'm telling you. So when you, when you look at pioneers, these strategic school marms, and, we, and you think about what does it take, and both these women had passion. You think about it, passion and energy. But one of the things they did is they committed to the journey. And that is a life lesson I'm not sure. I think everybody comes to it at a different mo part in their life. For myself, I was a lieutenant commander. I'd just come off of sea duty. Um, and so uh, to put that in perspective, I had about um, 10 years of, of service time at that point. And I'm in DC and I'm finding I'm being asked to do all these additional things in addition to my day job. And the reason I'm being asked is because I'm one of the senior women in my community. I, I serve at sea. Uh, and this is before a time we'd had women in the, in the Navy long enough to even have a woman sea of a ship. So the combat exclusion law is about to be repealed. They would like me to be a spokesperson. I'm like, uh, no, no. Uh, and I'm just being asked to do all these briefs and everything else. And it's like a second and some days feels like a third job. And literally, uh, I was on the phone with my mother one day and she said, uh, she's just listening to me vent and then she goes, stop, stop, think about it. Think about where you are historically. You are the first of whatever. She goes, unless you quit, there's probably not going to be anybody who's going to catch you, right? Just because of the time. She said, so you're going to continue to be the first of whatever until you quit. So she goes, you better embrace this lifestyle now or get out. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was looking for sympathy here, Mom. No, no, I mean, she was, you know, only a mother could be that brutally honest and put life in perspective. And she was absolutely right. I had to embrace the journey. OK, so what happens when you don't embrace the journey? Well, let's look at one pioneer woman, Elizabeth Greer, 1847. She's got her wagon, she's going across country, they're past Missouri, they're out in the wilderness, and they're just getting up one morning. She's got her husband and kids, boys and girls, and then one day Elizabeth goes, I, I just cannot do this anymore. And she does a sit down right there in the middle of nowhere. And her husband's like, where the wagon train's moving, get in the wagon. She refuses. So he packs the kids up, starts heading out, leaves his wife in the desert. And she finally realizes, oh, this isn't such a good idea. So she starts literally tracking behind her husband and the wagon up on high hills. And then somewhere along the way, he realizes that he has regret. So he grabs one of the horses, puts his son on it, and sends his son back down the path to try and find Elizabeth. At that moment, Elizabeth goes, ah. She runs down from the hills and uh, says, I'm here, I'm here. And he's, husband's like, my God. How Where's our son? She goes, I was so mad I knocked him out with a rock. So the husband freaks out, grabs another horse, and goes chasing after the son. Elizabeth says, this is my moment, and burns the wagon down. <laughs> They're done. They're done. Elizabeth clearly has not committed to the journey. <laughs> So I want you to think about it. You are going down a path. You are developing something strategic, and you are going to invoke change in your life or in other people's lives. You better commit to the journey, because you will find yourself burning down a wagon, right? <laughs> and some of you have already burnt down wagons. Some of you have already had that part in your life. So you have to decide up front, I am committing to this to the end, and hang on to it. Well, then this gets to this whole passion piece, the piece I had with my mom. I'm not, I'm not dealing with this well. And so one day, um, I was pretty lucky. When you make one star in the Navy, you go through an assessment process. You do a 360. You get feedback. And then at the end of a week, you get to sit down with the coach. And I'm thinking, I am so going to talk about this passion thing and motivation with my coach. And so I get in 
I get in with her, we go over my scores, and then we're talking about it, and I'm talking about leadership, and I'm talking about, you know, being passionate and committing to the journey. And she goes, oh, oh, Admiral, that's easy. And I go, what? So I've got my notebook out. This is, I now know what, this is, this is a coach. She's a psychologist. This is going to be great. She goes, listen, come here. And I go, she goes, fake it till you make it. <laughs> I go, well, how much are we paying this woman? <laughs> no, no. And I thought, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me think about what she just said. Fake it till you make it. So as a leadership, as a leader, is it my responsibility to project the positive energy about myself and my project? Because if I don't do it, who else is going to do it? And maybe, as blunt as my coach was, would I have been more willing to accept it if it had been more eloquently put? If I had been reading Maya Angelou, who said, you know, if you can change something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. That this obligation of commitment comes with it, this energy and positive drive. And that we have to find it within ourselves. It's probably not going to be given to us. So what's fascinating about these journeys is that as people planned and they load up the wagon, you know, there's this whole sorting through of what's important. And, and literally, the history of the West and the Oregon Trail is filled with the stories of the pioneers as they got farther out, tossing things out of the wagon. And literally, their lives spread across the country because grandma's dishes, sentimental as they are, by the time you're two-thirds of the way across country, just bring weight. Love that china, but I need to have weight for preserved fruit and food, and the horses are getting tired. And so people found that as they went farther along the journey that that small upright piano is just weight you don't need. And out it go. And what I'm saying is if you're on a pioneering journey, you need to think about your mental baggage. Now, you can start the journey, and you're going to toss it out, because <laughs> you're just going to have to just as you go along, but you literally have an opportunity to decide up front what you need to let go of before you start your, your journey. And it's interesting, the same is true for strategies. This is, this is the, the focus piece. If you want to get to success in a strategy, you got to focus. Businesses will refer to it as the business core mission, but you got to know what's vital and let the rest of it go and get to the end in order to get to success. Stamina. So you gotta, you gotta have stamina. So I want to share with you a story of a pioneering woman. And some of you may have heard of Mary Walker, the surgeon. This is a different Mary Walker who lived before the surgeon Mary Walker of the Civil War. This Mary Walker was a pioneer in Oregon in the 1830s and 1840s. And this is an excerpt from her diary on just a random day in her life. So Mary Walker goes, puts in her journal, journal, rose about five, had breakfast, got my housework done about nine, baked six loaves of bread, made a kettle of mush, and have a suet pudding and beef boiling. And then she continues on, just setting her house in order, doing a little hand hoeing and plowing. And then late in the day, her journal ends, 9 o'clock p.m. was delivered of another son. <laughs> now, some of you are going to complain stamina is not finding child care. <laughs> and I, I will tell you, I will tell you, we have a heritage of women and stamina and strength in this country that we just have to remind ourselves exist. And that's how this country was born. Uh, and that, I see the same thing every day in my military. The young woman over on the far side, that's uh, Charlene Plant in the Air Force. She's a search, uh, e uh, evasion, and rescue uh, instructor, all of five foot one and first tour in the Air Force 
screened and it's a highly competitive program to be an instructor to teach others how to be survive a prisoner of war experience and live out in the woods and uh, she said I she's lived most of her birthdays now in cold environments and eating bugs and uh, what what a great example of stamina and then of course for us more recently those are Marines who happen to be women part of the all-female engagement teams on the ground in Afghanistan and so we have not only this heritage of strength and stamina but it exists today and each of you has that but I will tell you if you are going on a journey whether it's execution of a strategic plan or a pioneering journey of your own you need stamina and for the average human being that's just plain old health but you gotta live and live it every day in order for it to exist a sense of humor and a sense of self so I wanted to introduce you to someone who was a co-worker of Mildred McAfee who grew up to be a captain in the Navy Captain Winifred Collins and so Vivian mentioned I received the Captain Winifred Collins Award for Leadership she served in the Navy from the 40s to the 60s and eventually became the head of the waves in the 1960s so when I got the award I got a chance to meet her and she's one of these inspirational leaders who before the word mentor was invented believed in reaching out to women officers of the next generation and providing wisdom and guidance and, and in the end I'll just tell you she was just a hoot she's just a phenomenal person but she had this sense of self that transcended rank that was really what I found most inspiring so I wanted to share with you a story she told about herself uh, and thankfully she eventually wrote a book before she died and uh, I think she was a she was one of the first women I think it's Harvard Harvard Business School graduate in the 30s and so you can imagine why Lieutenant Commander McAfee brought her in as one of the first waves because of her ability to organize uh, a corporation on a large level when the war started waves the women volunteers were not allowed to serve overseas so you got to think about it Hawaii was not uh, um, not part of the continental United States so waves were not even allowed to serve in Hawaii and of course that was a dangerous place because that's where the war started for us with the towards the end of the war we said no nope, the waves are doing such a great job we want to move them out to Hawaii and have them take over the administrative duties for men so we can push more men to ships so Captain Collins uh, and she was Lieutenant Quick in those days Winifred Quick she, before she got married uh, she's picked and two of her best friends Winifred Love and Louise Well, who are all three lieutenants, they're going out to Hawaii to help set up the base to bring women enlisted and to take over the duty. So they're the organizers. So this is exciting. Now, this is the part of the story that's almost like a sea story. And I will tell you, I'm from Colorado, and this never happened to me. There was a Denver millionaire who heard about this, who happened to own a home on Oahu on the beach, and said ladies I hear you're going to Hawaii and I'm not using my beach home feel free on the weekends to go to my house <laughs> and there's a steward there who takes care of it and you can take liberty at my home so I'm still waiting for that day to happen to me <laughs> really and I'm from Aurora <laughs> surely there's a millionaire there uh, and so they get to Hawaii they start work and then that first weekend, you know, they're rushing out to the beach house. And it's this beautiful home with the big glass window looking at the waves coming in. And Louise Wilde and Winifred go in to put on their swimsuits. And uh, Winifred Quick is standing in the window looking out. And then she sees a man walking down the beach. He's in an Aloha shirt and shorts. And she's looking and she goes, my gosh, that guy looks a lot like Admiral Bull Halsey who was one of the iconic war fighters for my Navy in the war. And he would occasionally come back from sea and their headquarters were in Hawaii and they'd gear up for the next phase of the campaign. And as he gets closer, she's like, my God, I think that is Admiral Halsey. Well, this guy comes right up to the door, knocks, and so the steward opens up, he asks to come in, and she's like, uh, hello, I'm Winifred Quick. And he doesn't say anything, and then he just starts talking, he goes, hey I've I've always seen this house It's the first time I've seen it's occupied it's a beautiful house I know this is rude but could could I see the rest of the house 
And so she asked the steward to go get him a drink and says, well, yes, of course. And then Winifred Love and Louise Wilde come in and, and they're in their swimsuits and she starts to introduce them and then all of a sudden the guy gets in a panic, oh my God, and he runs out the door. Now, being lieutenants, they're like, what the heck just happened? Was that really Admiral Halsey? What? And then, you know, being really good lieutenants, they go, well, let's just go swimming. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so Monday morning, she's at her desk, her new desk, and the phone rings, and it's uh, Admiral Halsey's chief of staff, who's a two-star. And he goes, is this uh, Lieutenant Quick? And she's like, yes. And she goes, did, uh, did Admiral Halsey visit you in a beach house this weekend? <laughs> and she goes, I, I think so. And, he, and Admiral Carney goes, well, why didn't you introduce yourself? And she goes, because he didn't introduce himself. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've ever been anywhere near military, you don't know how ballsy it is for a lieutenant to say something like that to an admiral, trust me. And uh, so he starts, I guess he starts chuckling. He goes, okay, here's, here's what happened. He goes, Admiral Halsey, when he's back, likes to walk along that beach and think. He goes, it's a, there's a recreational center there, he'll go to the rec center, you know, and then he'll just start walking on the beach thinking about the war and everything else. And he said, and he has been admiring that house and he did want to see it. He said, but when he got to the house and he comes in, the reason he was in a panic is he sees you guys and then he runs back and he gets to the rec center and he orders everybody in there and he gets his aide to camp and he starts yelling, my God, my God, that beach house has women in it, three beautiful women in it, and their names are Quick Wild Love. <laughs> he goes, I think they're spies. <laughs> he goes, I think they're there to, to get us to come to the house and they're gonna seduce secrets out of us. <laughs> and his staff's like, what? And he's like, I need to know, get intelligence going. Who are these women? <laughs> Find out. And so the staff starts turning away and the next morning, they come in to brief Admiral Halsey and they go, Admiral Halsey, good news, good news. There's only naval officers at the house. And Admiral Halsey's like, I didn't see any naval officers. <laughs> <laughs> and so his staff has to walk him through it. Women naval officers. <laughs> Halsey's like, dear God, not even the Japanese did this to me. <laughs> so she taught me, you have to have a sense of self that transcends change. And uh, we had this great CNO, Admiral Borda. He said, change is funny. Change will hurt people's minds like a new pair of shoes hurts your feet. And then eventually, you know, you kind of walk in them and you get used to them. But she, she knew that and uh, never lost her core sense. So you're on this journey. You're a pioneer and you get to the end and you're like, wow. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. And then you realize the there is not done. Because you have to build your home. And so when you get to the end of your strategic plan, what is the end? Is it what's your stop place? And then when you realize you get the foundation in place, you have to build. That getting there is just part one. And all those other attributes that helped you get there, committing to the journey, that stamina, that sense of self and sense of humor, now they're really going to come into play. Because now you've got to build on what you've set the foundation. It's fascinating. But what's interesting is you go along the journey and then you build this house and you're sitting back and you've achieved whatever you've wanted to achieve. That's sort of when you have that first point in your life where you can take a deep breath and kind of look at, did my strategic plan achieve what I want to achieve? Did I achieve what I want to achieve? And that's also probably the first time that you could step back and go, oh my gosh, I've got neighbors and we got to help each other. So the other part of this is this visualization of that end state and who you want to be and where you want to be. And it's important for a strategic plan as it is important for you as an individual. And one of the best stories I heard about this when you think about school marms is uh, uh, through an international sea power symposium, I met the CNO of the Nigerian Navy and he said, hey, I've got a woman admiral in my Navy, she's getting ready to retire, but would you give her a call and 
because I'm sure you have some common experiences. So I reach out to Admiral Aituno Hotunu, who came into the Nigerian Navy in the 80s, and she had actually wanted to go into the Nigerian Army. She was a trained uh, architect. Her degree was in architect, architecture. And the Army said, nope, we don't, we don't take women at all. So she went to the Navy, and they said, well, we could probably use you as a logistician. You have engineering background. And so she stayed in and made it all the way, uh, became a one-star in 2010, and then made it to two-star. First woman, one-star in their Navy, probably their first woman captain, one-star, and then two-star. She just retired this last fall. But then she told me a great story on the phone. She said when she was a commander, she realized, and she was about the 20-year point, that she was the only one. She was it. And she was having a hard time understanding where she was and, and what other women engineers were out there who were doing what she was doing. So she goes on the Internet, and she comes across the story of Grace Hopper, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, who uh, first woman from Yale to get a doctorate, mathematics in the 30s. And when World War II breaks out, Grace offers her services to the United States Navy. And we're all in. We have to give her a waiver for her age because she's 37. And we have to give her an age waiver for her weight because she's only 105 pounds. And uh, we bring her in. And thank God we did. So she gets put into a uh, sort of innovative cell engineering. And this is the cell that creates computer engineering. And this is the cell that grows into modern day computing. And she becomes the woman who helps create COBOL. And she's the woman who, because of her work in computer engineering, starting in the Navy and then staying with it after the war as a civilian, she's credited. She became the first woman who was the, computers, the m m computers, computer scientist male of the year. It was a, they didn't change the name of the award. So she not only became nationally known, she became internationally known. And she's the person who coined the phrase bug in the machine, literally, literally. If without Grace Hopper, we would not have computing that we have today. And uh, so Admiral Aitunu Hotunu is searching the internet and comes across an icon iconic woman engineer. And she's so taken with this story and Admiral Hopper's success. She cuts her picture, she prints it out and cuts it out and sticks it on her cor cork board when she's a commander. And she looks to that as, you know, I can be, I can be that. I can grow up to be that. And kept it all the way up to when she made two star. And so when you're on these pioneering journeys or you're creating a strategic plan, you sort of have to have a model in your mind of what success looks like in order to get to that destination. So it was interesting to me uh, growing up in Colorado to hear about the quilting bees and barn raising. Uh, but as you get older, you suddenly figure out the quilting bee is not about quilts. It's really about an opportunity for women to get together and exchange information. It's about sharing wisdom. It's everything from, as the women were primarily as pioneers, the entire healthcare system for the house, physician to whatever, uh, nurse, to helping support, to learning how to shoot in case you were attacked. And so all of these opportunities to connect meant that they were sharing experience sets, understanding challenges, and giving each other tips on how to survive, but not just survive, how to be successful, how to build a neighborhood, how to settle the land. And so what it taught me is that you have to have the same belief set and stay connected to other women. That in particular, if you're in an environment where there's not a lot of you, those connection points are going to be the windows where you recharge your battery because it's very difficult to go to someone who doesn't look like you and believe they're going to have the same experience sets. There's, uh, it makes, sometimes that can be helpful. But you also need to have a forum where you can get together with women who have the same experience sets. A group like this it can be very powerful, particularly if it transcends this place and time. That this quilting bee that started here is a quilting bee for life.
It's amazing with the internet, that is quite possible. That that journey of connectedness can go forever. And the biggest group I'm still connected with is the women from my class at Annapolis, the women from 82. We started with 96 and 64 of us graduated. Luckily for us, one of our classmates, uh, Holly Johnson, she, when she left the Navy, she went on to get her doctorate in double E. And then when the internet was created and bulletin boards were created, she connected all of the women in my class together. But just being virtually connected and then moving into groups when those sprung up caused us to become physically connected. So once a year, ever since graduation, once a year, we have a home, just a women's homecoming breakfast. The only thing that's changed is in the last five years, the daughters of my <laughs> classmates are starting to come. But what I found fascinating is over the last 10 years, women from other year groups would sometimes invite themselves to our class of 82 women breakfast. And they would say, wow, I don't know why we don't have something like this. It's pretty neat. And because we stayed connected, then as we traveled across country, somebody would just come up online and say, I'm going to be in this area or any of you, and they'll get together. They stay, have many quilting bees every day of the year. Something's going on with the women in 82. And being able to talk about our shared experiences as we grew up in the Navy, and then some uh, left and became reservists, and then some just had unbelievable lives. My, one of my roommates left and became a medical doctor and went back home to Branson, Missouri. She was a C-130 navigator when she was in the Navy and flew missions out of Antarctica. Exciting life. But having those different perspectives and then she, and Paula would be the first to say being a woman, learning to become a woman doctor in an in a, in a area where there aren't a lot of women in health care period felt a lot like coming into the Navy when we did. And so being able to have someone to talk to is really vitally important. And the same is true if you're developing a strategic plan. you got to reach out to somebody who has common experience sets or trying to do the same thing. you got to build in a sounding board as you work your way through the process. So that's it. That's, that's the pioneering. That's from this strategic school marm. <laughs> Commit to the journey, travel light, stamina is important, sense of humor and sense of self, and stay connected. That's the best I can do for you today. So with that, thank you. I'm sure many of you recognize that strategic school marm. No, oh, well, one of, yes, she was a sponsor for a Navy ship, so one of our 272 that we have. Thank you so much for your speech, Admiral Howard. It was fantastic. I personally enjoyed the anecdotes and all the stories. So lovely. Um, so my question is pertaining to the role you think, if at all, that passion plays on this pioneering journey and how you think we should define passion whether we should define it as this emotional attachment to something or just having grits and being able to get the job done. So I would say grits, to me, mental grits goes more on the stamina side. And you're definitely going to have to have that, sort of a tenacity and hanging on. Uh, the passion piece, um, you got to get to your core self. And then you got to be ready for what I call Indian attacks. You know, if you're going to go into wild country, you better learn how to shoot, better learn how to protect yourself. And one of the things I've noticed is language can be very dividing in mixed uh, gender environments. A man is allowed to be passionate, and women are just emotional. And uh, so you've got to get to your sense of self. And, and, and be objective and understand when you are being truly passionate about something. And that, and that is absolutely, perfectly okay and probably expected as a leader. And there's been times when I've been in a meeting where I've been off the governor and 
someone will, you know, start to do the settle down, and I go, well, let me just make it clear for you. I'm not passionate. I'm emotional right now. And <laughs> please, please have a seat. So I, I, you just have to feel comfortable and understanding and being objective about where you are. But it is, to me, it is perfectly okay for to be passionate or emotional about certain things. When I tend to get emotional, it's about something with our sailors. There's either a policy that's being advocated that's going to hurt our sailors or Marines, or there's something that went terribly wrong where leaders should have prevented what happened. And I think that's perfectly understandable. Thank you again so much for your talk. I'd like to ask you a little bit about the conf I see a little bit of a conflict almost between sense of humor and sense of self. I can see kind of sense of humor connecting to maybe less baggage. And what I mean by this is, you know, if you're able to laugh something off, you may be more likely to kind of be able to slide by things that may otherwise pose problems. Mm -hmm. Then there's this thing that sense of self that I think that it sounds like for you and for many other people in this room as something that relies on principles and makes you kind of want to dig your heels in, not in an, a stubborn way or a bullish way, but in a way that is very principled. And so I'd kind of like to hear what you have to say about the conflict between those two and how you decide between them. That's interesting. I don't see that being principled and having a sense of humor are in conflict. But I do understand that everybody has different sense of, senses of humor. And one of the uh, most, I was in a presentation and a two-star was giving this presentation and it was in a joint environment and he said something and then uh, somebody pushed him on it because they thought he was making a joke and the Admiral goes, oh no sir, I don't have a sense of humor so I learned a long time ago to try not to be funny. <laughs> and he was being very honest and it came across funny because he was being very honest and uh, and so wherever your sense of self is, if you really don't have, if you uh, tend to be introvert and you really don't have uh, that type of personality, let that go. That does not mean, though, that even if you're an introvert and you don't have an outward sense of humor, it doesn't mean that should stop you from laughing if somebody does something funny, right? That's part of the normal socialization. So one of the things, as I've been on this leadership journey, is really trying to get thoughtful about people and understanding that everybody's on a different spectrum of introvert and extrovert, and some people are mixed. Uh, but there's things you can do that let them know you're willing to be social when it, when it really, you should be willing to let them know you, you could be social. I once had a question like this once because in some organizations, for some reason, social life tended to revolve around golf. And you're laughing at me, but it's true. Trust me. Um, and the real issue is it's not really social that out there on the nines, there's business being done. And if you weren't part of that, you were being out of the loop. So, you know, the first time I was in an organization and it was a joint organization and golfing outings once a month were part of it, I don't golf and I don't freaking care to golf. <laughs> so uh, I said, okay, I'm going, but I don't golf. And the guys are like, and it was all guy, or, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to drive the cart. And more importantly to you, I'm going to buy the beer at the end of the, <laughs> they're like, ooh, you're in. You're a part of the team. So I'm there driving the cart. And I had a great day because it was some Sam Snead golf course. And of course you find out is everybody's at different skill sets. So at every hole there's tips and everything else. And I would read the tips and I go, none of you are like that. <laughs> and I would give them a hard time the whole way. And then, you know, they were talking me through the game and walking me through, oh, this is the women's area. And, it's not, and I wasn't golfing. I was just learning. And then they'd swing up and I'd go, well, apparently there really is no need for a women's and men's area from the distance your ball went. <laughs> <laughs> so it turned out to be a grand day and a grand day for all of us because I went and socialized and it was part of our team building. And I didn't have to become a golfer. I don't want to be a golfer. But I could still participate. And I could still be myself. And I did buy the beer at the end of the hole. So 
definitely part of the team in that way. So I, I, it's okay to under if you, like the one Admiral said, I'm really not funny. Um, I really, really doesn't have a very somber sort of person. That's fantastic. He knows that about himself. He just has to remain true to that. And for oh, hello. <laughs> um, your talk today, it was wonderful. Um, something that Rear Admiral Margaret Kibben talked about yesterday in her visiting lecture See, was... That's a rule set I have. I should never follow Margaret. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, something she, she mentioned... She has greater moral authority on top of everything else. <laughs> Well, she mentioned this increasing, or what she interprets to be an increasing separation between civilian population and the military population. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask how you think um, relationships may be fostered, particularly between women, civilian women and military women, in order to address this separation, and how you think strengthening those relationships may contribute um, to greater understanding between civilian and military populations. So one of the things I, I've talked about is I am not interested in politics, but we used to have a much greater percentage of veterans in the House and Senate, so that perspective was there, and we have a very tiny percentage now. I, I, I really don't care what party they are. I am really just very happy when somebody like Tammy Duckworth runs for office, and not only that women's voice, but that women's veterans voice is in the House and the Senate, so that perspective is there. So uh, as um, women come by and say, oh, it's time, I'm retiring, I, I kind of tickle them and go, hey, you know, maybe you want to be the local mayor or whatever I do. They go, well, are you going to do that? Hell no! <laughs> but you, you know, you, you have the right personality or we, we need that perspective. So at some point, our women veterans are going to have to under, well, first of all, the biggest thing I've learned talking to VA is women veterans do not see themselves as veterans. And I'm like, what is that about? And then as I've talked to military groups, women's military associations, I, I start to understand that's true. That for some reason, particularly if they served at a time where they were constrained by law to administrative duties, they go, well, I didn't actually go to war, I didn't do this. And I'm thinking, if you were a guy who had the same job and you're retired, you'd be putting that red vest on, putting your bill belly up at the local VFW going, yeah, I was in, yep, yep, yep. You'd, you'd you know, you'd have all, all your doodads out every parade, woo-hoo. Uh, and women go, well, I just didn't do that much. Stop! <laughs> you did more than 99% of the population in this country. And it's vitally important in every Every job everybody has in the military, whether it's the administrative piece to the actual front end war fight, because some, we're a big organization. Without the paperwork, guns don't shoot sometimes. Got it? So every, every person has a role, and they should be very proud of their service, but they tend not to identify as veterans. So VA has actually started just to refer to people as former military, and they're finding they're bringing more women in. But the same thing is, um, true in the communities that uh, I think for us one of the best ways to get after it is to help people understand who the women reservists are in their communities. But I, and as I've talked to uh, different groups, particularly women reservists, I've said you need to, you need not to be afraid and you need to self-identify on Veterans Day. That you're in the Army, Guard, Navy, Air Force Reserve and that you've served overseas and let people know that you exist. Because we still tend to have a male face on all of this. And I think uh, I, women have done, women, I have often said this, we talk about this generation and I appreciate them. They, it's phenomenal because we're an all volunteer force and we had Americans coming in to fight a, a war basically based on our Constitution and ideals of liberty. And that's fantastical when you think about other wars where we had to conscript. Really says a lot about this generation. 
But if you agree to that, then what do you say about women who have only served in the military as volunteers? Because we were never conscripted. And when you look at the ultimate patriot, this heritage of women in the military, we, we are the iconic human being for, for the ideals of the Constitution. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.